cervical cancer is caused by the human papilloma virus or HPV. And HPV has actually lived with humans for a very long time. It's probably actually co-evolved with humans and there are lots of different types of HPV that have really adapted to live with humans. The key discovery of course was that some of those types of HPV can cause cancer at a variety of sites in both men and women that led directly to the development of a vaccine and directly to HPV as a better screening test for cervical cancer. In May uh, this year, Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization, initiated a call to action for cervical cancer elimination. And this has really galvanized action for aid agencies and the research community around what's it going to take to scale up HPV vaccination and cervical screening, particularly in low and middle income countries. Uh, the estimates that we've done here at Cancer Council New South Wales suggest that we could prevent up to 13 million cervical cancer cases in the next 50 years. So it's enormous and I think we, we really need to keep our eye on that ball. And countries like Australia are really looking imminently now at the potential for elimination of cervical cancer. We in, at Cancer Council New South Wales, we're soon to announce our key findings, but we think depending on the final definition of elimination, it's a really attainable target. We're predicting that it could happen by 2030 if we are thinking about elimination as getting below a threshold of four per 100,000 women developing cervical cancer. And that will be achieved both through the impact of the vaccination program. So it started over 10 years ago. It's having this ongoing um, and continue to have an impact going forward and it will happen through the impact of the new HPV screening program. So those two amazing prevention mechanisms working together will help to eliminate cervical cancer in Australia in the very foreseeable future. Australia is actually leading the way in better integrating cervical screening with HPV vaccination. The biggest thing that's been happening over the last decade is the um, building of evidence on HPV DNA testing as a cervical screening test. So the pap smear screening program in fact in Australia has been very successful indeed. It did reduce cancer incidence and mortality by about half but we're now moving to a newer technology that directly tests for the presence of HPV which of course because it causes cervical cancer gives us a really sensitive test for being at risk. In high income countries, there's an interest in doing what Australia has now done, which is moving to appropriate interval screening, five yearly screening, for example. We still test them regularly and several times in their lifetime, but we don't need to do it as frequently as we did in pap smear based programs, which required much more frequent screening. And we're still getting better outcomes. And also in ways that allow women to collect their own samples. And if we can just get this test to most women in low and middle income countries, even if it's only once or twice in their lifetime between about the ages of 30 and 50 years because that's when we have maximal impact. It'll make an enormous difference and it will really bring forward the benefits that we'll see over the long term in cervical cancer prevention and um, before the vaccine impact kicks in. Of course the vaccine implementation and the success of HPV vaccination was one of the triggers for updating our screening program. But also in parallel to that, there were the rigorous processes of building and reviewing evidence from the international um, studies around HPV testing. And also to incorporate that in uh, good and comprehensive models of the health outcomes and the cost um, and economic implications of introducing this new way of screening were very important. Uh, we in public health and epidemiology, I think have work to do in designing and testing approaches to scaling up both vaccination and screening in low and middle income countries. And also in supporting the long-term predictions of impact, you know, what could the global picture look like in 50 years time if this can be done successfully. We really need to also bear in mind that vaccination takes time to have an effect to protect against cancer. We're delivering vaccines to young pre-adolescents. The peak age of risk of cancer of the cervix is in the 40s and 50s and beyond. So it will take time to have an effect. We all want to see a galvanization of action to really deliver these incredibly successful prevention mechanisms to the countries that need it most. 
So this has been a really successful uh, collaboration, I think, between not-for-profits, researchers and governments. I think in terms of the Australian contribution, of course we've had Professor Ian Fraser and Dr Jean Zhao and their key role in the development of the virus-like particle technology that is key to the development of the vaccines. It's also been innovations in public health. Australia was the first country in the world to introduce a national um, HPV-based vaccination program in young women in 2007. It's one of the first countries that then included males in the vaccination program. And it's now the first country to introduce HPV-based screening in a population of women that have received the HPV vaccine. The key message for women is that it's really important to access both um, of these prevention mechanisms. So for parents of young girls at school, it's very important to make sure your daughters and sons now are accessing this potential to protect against HPV-related cancers in their lifetime. And then for women, it's important to take up the offer of cervical screening. So in Australia's new HPV-based screening program, women will receive their first invitation when they turn 25 and they'll be asked to attend screening every five years thereafter. You know, there's 600,000 cases a year at the moment globally. That's going to grow to a million uh, within the next couple of decades um, if nothing is done. And Australia has less than 1,000 cervical cancer cases. Uh, which is of course reflective of our achievements. But we're punching well above our weight when it comes to contributing to this global picture, to this global drive to eliminate cervical cancer. That started with Ian Fraser and Jan Zhao and their contributions. But I think it's now a network of researchers and policy makers in Australia who've really driven that successful implementation of HPV vaccination and cervical screening that are taking this forward both in Australia also in our region and in fact now globally. So I think that one of the reasons that the HPV vaccine story has been such a success story is that we've had a really clear understanding of the etiology of course of cervical cancer and I don't think it will be as simple for other cancers. But the other part of this, the story that I think is more translatable is that just the incredible success that we've had in the Australian research community in working across what has been in the past boundaries between basic scientists and translational medicine. And I think one of the reasons that we've seen this success is because Ian Fraser himself has really been part of that journey from the basic sciences to public health and in a sense is really helping to hand on that baton to really support those of us working in population health to, to make this dream a reality, to get these innovations to, to the people that need them.